this lesson, we're going to talk about Net Promoter Score. This is a very important KPI, specifically for brands. So we're looking here maybe at an individual product, but normally we're looking at the business overall. So how is our donut shop doing? Is our donut shop in Mexico, Missouri viewed favorably by its customers? Do its customers recommend going to that donut shop to their friends and family? And that's often seen as a very good predictor of growth. So it's fairly simple to calculate this. It's based on a question. How likely is it that you would recommend this service or brand to a friend or a colleague? So in our case, it would be our donut shop. The scale goes from 0 to 10, with 0 being not at all likely, 10 being highly likely, and 5 being neutral. So we're going to ask this question of our customers. We're going to survey them either at the time of purchase, at the point of sale, or after they have purchased their donuts. Maybe we collect their email. We have some other way to collect this data from them. Once we look at this data, we divide this into three distinct groups. The first one is passives. These are the folks that are going to score in the 7 or 8. Generally, these are going to be unenthusiastic, probably satisfied, but they might try competitors in the future. Okay, so they might enjoy our donuts and they might uh, not have any particular complaints but they're not overly enthusiastic. They're not like, this is the best thing ever. Okay, so they might be likely to try others in the future. So moving on from the passives, we have the detractors. These are the folks that are scoring somewhere between zero and six. We would consider these customers to be generally unhappy. They're likely to spread negative messages via social media, and word of mouth. The last group that we'll discuss here is the promoters. These are the ones at the very top of the scale that they are highly likely to recommend our service or brand to a friend or colleague. They're loyal, they're happy, they're repeat customers. They're likely to spread positive message via social and word of mouth. So these are going to be the ones that are going to drag their friends in and say, these are the best donuts ever. You've got to try these out. So that's how we think about taking the survey and how we're going to divide up the responses. Once we do that, we're going to calculate something called the Net Promoter Score, or NPS. This is a very common score, and you see this talked about uh, for big companies. So brands will talk about their NPS scores at quarterly meetings, shareholder calls, things like that. So the way we calculate this is fairly simple. We take the percentage of promoters and we subtract the percentage of detractors. Notice that we leave the passives out of this particular equation. That doesn't mean they're not important. It doesn't mean that we want to avoid talking with them or we don't want to convert them into promoters. We certainly do. Those are probably the most likely to become promoters. So they're important. But for the calculation of the NPS score, we do not think about the passives. So once again, we begin with this one question. And here's a question that I ask my students. How likely are you to recommend a homecoming to a friend or colleague? Well, I've got 72 responses from my class. 15 were detractors. They would not be likely to recommend it. 20 were passives, so unenthusiastic. And 38 were promoters. 
So I would just take this, figure out the percentages of each of these. So I have 52% are promoters, 20.55% are detractors, and so our NPS score is 31.51%. Now you may be wondering in the back of your head, well, how many respondents do I need for my NPS score to be relevant? Well, this is not the same thing as a traditional survey or survey research, so it's not really an exercise in statistical analysis. Um, so the, your overall score is probably less important than individual scores and some of the opportunities you uncover. Now, how do we uh, uncover opportunities here? Well, we're going to ask one or two other questions. The main one we want to ask is, why did you give us that score? So tell us why you gave A, and then put in whatever score they gave, this will help you determine why people are leaving your service, why are they leaving your product, or why is your product particularly sticky? Why are they sticking with it? Why are they enthusiastic supporters? Was it something about the customer service that they received that was so great that that made them stay with you and recommend their friends? Was it something about the product itself? Was it something about being associated with your brand? Was there some other thing about their experience that we can then double down on, we can emphasize for our current customers? So there are ways to improve your MPS score. Uh, a couple of them is to systematize your process for tracking and reacting to it. So you're going to want to do this on a regular basis. It's not just a one and done type of thing. Empower your team to engage with the customers so that they have an idea what the customers are saying, if they're recommending it to other folks, if they're new customers just coming in, or if they are customers about to churn away. Investing in customer-facing employees is probably one of the most important things you can do because that customer interaction can make a big difference. Okay, and so keeping your finger on the pulse of your customer sentiment and taking steps to address their feedback quickly, you're going to be able to generate more loyal and happy customers. So another question you might be asking is, well, what is a good score? Well, anything above one means that you have more promoters than you do detractors. So that's a good thing. A negative score is probably not a very good result. It should be probably cause for alarm. However, it's going to vary greatly by industry. And here's an example that shows you some of the common benchmarks by industry. So you'll notice there are some that uh, are in the negative here. Um, and you can see how this varies. This gives you the actual ranges here um, for these different industries. So this kind of helps you. This is a good benchmark for us to use. So if we are running a software company and we have an NPS score of 60, well, that's fantastic. We're above the average, above even the highest for our industry, or one of the highest for our industry. However, if we have a negative 10, that's probably not so good. If we're in construction and engineering and we have a negative 10, well, then my, that might be um, more in line with what our industry colleagues. Now, there are other extensions to this. So, for example, you can use a net promoter score to actually measure employee sentiment, commonly known as employee net promoter score. So what you're asking here is you're asking your employees, how likely is it that you would recommend working here to other people, to their friends and colleagues? So that's a good indication for you as to how satisfied your employees are, whether they might actually be likely to churn out to leave your company. So 
and we didn't talk about this too much, but churn can also be applied to this area of employees. We might want to reduce our employee churn because we might in fact invest a lot in our employees and we don't want to see them leaving. So hopefully these short lessons have given you an idea about how managers take on these KPIs, how they use them within a framework of objectives and key results, and why we say that what gets measured gets managed.